You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your breath. Several of our members were, are in facing uh, surgery and treatments. We want to remember all those folks in our prayer later on today and throughout the week. Um, Mel Greeley had his 90th birthday last Friday, and I don't think Mel's here today. I was, was going to celebrate. 
right with him, but he's not here. So please I call your attention to all those announcements and uh, let us come and prepare to worship God. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let us praise him as we sing together how great thou art. <laughs>
there in your name, but gather from various parts of life and various walks of life, and we come seeking your blessing, seeking to come into your presence and be aware of your gracious love. We pray that as we gather, you will be in our midst, you will speak to our hearts, and you will open our hearts to the love that you share with us in order that we might share with others. We wait to hear your word, and we pray your blessing upon us all. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord, praying the prayer he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. spiritual as well as physical food. 
find the love and care we need from you that we might share with others. We pray for comfort for those on our minds and on our hearts, on our prayer lists, and in our circles of friends. We ask you boldly to heal those who are not well, to comfort those who are hurting, to fill those who are empty. And we know as we seek answers that, that your ways are perfect. Sometimes we fail to accept that. Help us to understand, Lord. Remind us, O oh God, that this is your church. We are your bride. Whether we meet in this room, join in on social media, or confined in our homes, or away in other places in the world, we pray that you would bless us as your church. Strengthen us and guide us as we seek to follow you, as we seek to help the lost, and as we seek a pastor Guide us in paths that are fruitful and pleasing to you. Now, O oh Lord, hear the quiet pleas of our own minds and hearts as we wait to hear a word from you. Speak, Lord. Your servants listen. In Jesus' name we pray.
Our scripture this morning is from the 8th chapter of Romans. Apostle Paul writing to the church in Rome, reminding them of God's love and God's support of them. In verse 28, he writes, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Those he, who, those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is to be one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it's written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Speak words, Lord, we need to hear. Speak to our need, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. There are several things that, that bind us as humanity. Things like the fear of death, the fear of being alone, Fear of sickness, of lostness, they're all common around the world in every civilization. Wherever you go, there are things that we share with all human beings. There are events in our lives that remind us of how vulnerable we are, how fragile life is, things that surprise us cause us to have fears of tragedy to appear. Death and separation from a loved one causes deep pain. We're alarmed when the telephone rings in the middle of the night and, and we see that it's from a family member. Our, our hearts are heavy when the doctor walks out with a concerned look on his face following our test. Our life seems to be ripped apart when we plan on something for a long time only to have it be dashed, such as being employed for years at the same job planning on retirement only to be unemployed or experiencing the loss of a loved one through a mental fog. 
these things that lay heavy on us and we deal with by being human beings, they haunt us. And like the Roman Christians to whom the Apostle Paul was writing, we deal with tragedy. We deal with tragedy in the face of God's love. And Paul wrote to them reminding them that God's love was there surrounding them. It was eternal and it's overpowering. He says, our sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory to be revealed in us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, he reminds them and us. In my devotions this week, Nicky Gumbel, the founder and, and uh, leader of Alpha program, talked about the Bishop of Durham in England who had the task of visiting and and ministering to the families of 170 miners that were killed in a mining accident. And he wondered what to say. He tried to deal with, with coming up with something that was comforting. And he, he struggled to find it. And he picked up a, 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 a bookmark that his mother had given him years before. And it said, God is love. And he looked at the hand-woven bookmark and on the back side were a, loose, a web of threads that had come together in this hand woven piece and it made no sense they were just senseless seemingly senseless threads that in a web but the other side said God is love and Gumble went on to say that in the world sometimes sometime it's like a a tangled web and the experiences we have don't make sense to us because we see the struggle and the pain. But the claim that Jesus is giving us and showing us the love of God, even though things may be difficult to understand, God is working out his loving purpose, even though our lives seem to be like that tangled web. And there are several things we need to recognize as we seek to deal with that cause that makes us fear. First, we need to realize that tragedy is no alien intruder. It is at home in the heart of God. And all human beings deal with that and are aware of that. We know that God suffers. We see it in the, the life of Jesus. There are those who would say God has no emotions, but that's not a true fact. We read that God so loved the world that he gave. We read that Jesus is called the suffering servant. On the cross, Jesus said, as he cried out, my God, my God, why? God has emotions and he shares the emotions that we have. God so loved the world that he gave his son. Woven into our lives are the emotions that we all share, even pleasant ones, love and giving and caring and joy we share with others and with God. And God is there with us in the twists and turns of life. The second thing we need to know about tragedy is we choose it ourselves. It's like a two-sided coin. We choose the things we love even though the other side is sorrow. When we commit to love someone, we know that one day we will lose that object of, of our love. And like that two-sided coin, we choose it because we would rather have that love even though it means pain sometimes rather than experience the loneliness in the valley of the shadows. Joni Erickson Tata is a quadriplegic. She suffered injury when she dove into a, 
a, a pool, and she's been like that for 40 years, but she has turned in to be a, a great vocalist, a writer, and one who has many messages to share. So often people ask her, why does God punish you the way he did? She said, God didn't punish me. And then she said this, God allows what he hates to accomplish what he loves. That'll stick with you a while. God allows what he hates to accomplish that which he loves. We also know, know that it's one of our most priceless possessions. We would not give it up, this tragedy we experience. We would not give it up if we could. We choose the pains of life because they pay for the joys of life and for the joys of eternity. It's part of the human story. Now that being said, the Apostle Paul speaks words of comfort. Comfort is from God. He said, that he reminds those hearers in Rome as well as us that he's working with us through the troubles and tragedies of life, he will see us through. Now, Paul does not say everything will work out for good. It's not true that everything works out for good. Paul writes this, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. Some translations say God works for the good with those who love him. What Paul is saying here is that those who love God and whom God is working, they can count on the fact that it will work out for good. What is good to God is good to us. George Matheson was a preacher who was engaged to be married when he suddenly found out he was going blind. His fiance broke off the engagement. She didn't want to be married to a, a man she would have to support because he was blind. But his sister Charlotte was available and she helped him, supported him through in his ministry. But then Charlotte eventually got married and he was left alone not knowing how he would deal with things. And he wrote that well-known hymn, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go. Through these words, he expressed his faith for all of us. O joy that seeketh me through the pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain. I feel the promise is not in vain that morn shall tearless be. How do we find the assurance of God's hand in our lives? First, Paul would say, we surrender. The golden key to comfort and assurance in the face of tragedy is to give in to God's hand. Let God lead us and let God work in our lives. We surrender ourselves to God's care and let God take over. And that is a sense of strength and hope when we do that. And it's not just a one time of surrendering, but some of us have to keep surrendering day after day. And God reminds us of his presence and in the midst of our struggles. And so he calls us to fully trust, fully trust in the fact that for God's people, things do work together for good. We're called to believe it. We're called to see the evidence in life and in history. Things work out for good to people that love God and are called according to his purpose, and so he guarantees it. Our part is to trust. Trust in God, to hope, to keep hoping in God's work and his hand and to keep worshiping and in worship we see God continue to move in our world and our lives.
Now that doesn't mean that all of our questions will be answered. We still have questions and we still have doubts. And we wonder why, why does this happen to me? And the obvious answer is why not me? But in all those questions, we understand that God cares for us. Focusing on the cross, we can see how much God loved us and how much God took action to express that love. Gave, and things work out even though there's pain, even that which brings life. Paul says that we live in the spirit which is life and not in the spirit of the world which is death. Next thing that grows out of this is that we face, frankly, our questions. God knows our doubts and knows our questions. It's so comforting to learn that to accept life in the way that God gives it, to look for God in many ways of life, in the twists and turns of life, we can see God working and moving. We look for God at work through our friends, through the events in life, even in church. You'd be surprised where God shows up. <laughs> Paul emphasizes the love of God, how powerful and eternal. Nothing can separate us from this love. Since God be for us, what difference does it make if anybody or anything is against us? Finally, we're called to live one day at a time. It doesn't help to live in the future, especially where tragedy is concerned. And we're warned, don't put a period where God puts a comma in your lives. Don't count on your plans. Hear the voice of God. He provides way stations along the way of life we can see his purpose at work. Eugene Peterson translated and paraphrased this, and I think it has a meaningful message, and I close with reading his version of this. The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment Sticking up for us. Do you, think, do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There's no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying, threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in Scripture. None of this phases us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced, as he quoted Paul, I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our Master, has embraced us. Amen. Let us pray. Speak, Lord. Remind us of your gracious love day after day. Help us to walk in it. And keep it in the forefront that you guide us even through tragedy toward the comfort that you alone can give. We give you thanks. And we make our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. A hymn is Jesus, Thou Boundless Love to Me.
find yourselves, you're there by God's appointment, not by accident, but in the providence of God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.